Welcome to Westminster United Church. My name is Cynthia and I am the Youth and Family Minister. Thank you for joining us this September as we explore the story of Exodus. One quick announcement for our Westminster congregation. Next Sunday at 11 a.m. will be our annual general meeting. If you have not yet received an email explaining how to connect, please visit our website at westminsterorangeville.ca slash AGM. Let us now take this moment to pause, to celebrate, and to prepare our hearts to worship God. Come, let us praise the God of Jacob, the God of Moses and Miriam, our God found in ancient stories, discovered in contemporary life our God who delivers people from oppression, who turns rocks into pools of water, who gives rest to the weary. Come, come draw near to the God of life, whose love endures forever. May the peace of Christ be with each one of you this day. God offers to us through prophets and apostles the words of life, which in faith become the living word. Let us listen for that word. A reading from the book of Exodus. The angel of God, 
who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on the dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. Then the Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at the dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. And so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. While I was reading the story of Exodus and the parting of the sea, I bet many of you were picturing Charlton Heston in your mind from the epic Ten Commandments movie. You're definitely not alone in imagining that. If you're familiar with when I preach, I often like to give some context and some background to our biblical story so it helps us understand. For Exodus, I wanted to first begin by telling you that it's important to remember that the story of Exodus, the book of Exodus, is primarily and first a Jewish text. It is the origin story, for lack of a better word, of the Jewish people. Carol Myers, a biblical scholar, and uh, writes a commentary on Exodus. She talks about it as the, ex the book of Exodus has had the greatest impact beyond its ancient worlds of any other narrative. It's about a hope of escape from oppression. It's a story about courageous prophetic activity. It is the story of how the Jewish people become a nation and how the Ten Commandments as are later given and they become God, become Yahweh's people. And there's hints in the text about, in this particular story of the Red Sea, of how it is kind of an origin story. When I first read this story, it's, you know, one I'm very familiar with. What came to my mind when I read it was when I heard the words, then God divided the waters. So when he's parting the sea. And I immediately remember the story of Genesis, the beginning of the creation story, when God separates the waters in the dome to make the skies and the earth and the sea. And it reminded me of that story about the origins, the creation, 
And in many ways, this story is about that creation, the creation of a new nation, of a new people. It's also interesting in the story, you hear about these pillars of cloud and fire. And cloud and fire are often references to day and night, the clouds of the day, the fires by night to see. Again, call, calling back to that creation story. So this is what this story is for the Jewish people. It is this whole of Exodus is about their creation of, as a people. Now we call it the book of Exodus. That comes from the tradition of the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. It would have been the, the Bible that Jesus and the disciples read um, at the time that was, they were more familiar with Greek than a Hebrew language. And in the Septuagint, this book is called the Exodus or the road out of Egypt in Greek, which the word road out of means Exodus. And that's where we get the term Exodus for this Bible, for this book of the Bible. Now, in the Jewish tradition, uh, a book of the Bible of the Torah is named after its opening words. So Genesis, in the beginning, that's what Genesis means. And so in, Jew in Hebrew, this book is known as names. Uh, it's because it begins with, in Exodus, these are the names of Jacob's descendants. And I think that's important to remember because names are about identity. And again, this Exodus story is about identity. It's about who God is, who the people are, and who the people are in relationship to God. So the story kind of has three phases. You have the Egyptians pursuing, then you have the split of the sea, and then you have the rejoining of the sea. And each section begins with the Lord says to Moses. And then these three sections happen. And so it points to how God is intimately involved in this story. It's always God's action that is, that is happening in the story through Moses. And that brings me to what I wanted to focus for this sermon, for this message to you today. A professor of mine who taught a preaching course on hope, on how to preach hope, he had a very basic thesis for that class, and it was simply that God's action brings hope. And he pushed us to think as preachers, as teachers, that that is our mission, that is part of our job when we get up to preach and give a message, is to point out how God's action brings about hope. Um, how the stories in the Bible point to God's action, point to hope through God's action. Jesus' actions always they bring hope to the people He interacts with. The story of the cross, God's action brings about hope. And I think it's part of our job as Christian people, as people of Easter, as people of resurrection, to tell and retell these stories of God's action and how it brings about hope, both those found in the biblical text and those stories from our own lives that speak to God's action and then brings about hope in our lives. You know, the story of the parting of the Red Sea, I mean, it's an epic, epic tale. It's dramatic. I mean, again, if you're remembering the movie, The Ten Commandments, and I highly recommend you see it, it's a classic. It's so dramatic, and it has all the good things a drama has. It has, it has a great backstory. It has uh, action. It has uh, trials and travails and all those different things. And then at the end, it is a great hope. So in the story of the Red Sea, of God acting, the people, they cry out, in distress to Moses, right? At the beginning, before I have, before the part I read to you, there's this little thing that happens, and it's a reoccurring theme you'll hear throughout the book of Exodus. The people crying out in distress and often complaining. And so they cry out in distress. Something I think we can all underst understand. When something new, something crazy, something fearful happens, we get, we get full of anxiety, we cry out, we might even complain. It's a natural human response to crisis. And so the people cry out to Moses, you know, 
they're being led away from Pharaoh and now they're lost kind of, they don't know what's happening. And they're like, why did you do this to us? Why have you let us out? Uh, that comes up again later when they're wandering in the desert for 40 years, but that's another sermon. And Moses replies to them, do not be afraid, stand firm and experience the deliverance God will perform. This word deliverance, it actually means it's salvation. It's about divine action. And so when in crisis, Moses' response to the people are, is, do not be afraid, stand firm and experience what God's about to do. And then the sea parts and they make it to the other side. And the Egyptian army is swallowed by the sea. This group of refugees, this group of form of enslaved people don't have much going for them against the might of Egypt. Uh, you hear, as I read in the story, you hear the repeat of all of Pharaoh's army and his charioteers and his chariots and the emphasis on the power and the might of the Egyptian army. Yet none of that stands in the face of God and God's action. God's action brings hope. But it's not just about us sitting around and waiting for God to fix everything. Um, and that, you know, nothing bad will happen if we just wait and be patient. I never want to say that to anyone. And I think to imply that is, well, theological malpractice. For these last six, seven months, of ex the world experience, uh, the world experiencing, and those of us experiencing the COVID pandemic, I think it'd be terrible to say, you know, if we just sit back, God will save us and deliver us. We know that's not true. But what this story tells us, and what we're reminded is that when God does act, it always brings about hope. And that's one of the ways we can identify God's action in the world, where we hear stories of hope that is God acting. The story in Exodus is a reminder throughout the entire biblical narrative that God is always reaching out, stretching out their hand, just like Moses stretches out his hand to part the sea, just like Christ stretched out on the cross there's always a renewal and there's always a, a deliverance and the possibility for something new and something positive and wonderful and joy and all those things. At the end of that story that I read to you, you know, God, uh, Moses tells the people, you know, stand firm. And at the end, he tells them, you know, believe in God. The word for the believe there is not necessarily, it's not believe in the sense of, you know, believe this creed and you'll be saved, but about relationship. It's about commitment and loyalty and being firm in the faith and sticking with this God who has delivered them. That's a theme that will come up again throughout Exodus and how the people often fail at sticking with the God that delivered them. But the point is, even despite those failures, God still sticks with us. God is still stretching out God's hand to us, always, whether it's parting a sea, whether it is the hope we feel when we engage in prayer or meet someone new or work with young people or whatever it is that we do in our lives that brings us together with others. When we experience that moment of, of joy, of, of closeness with others, that is God bringing us together and that is God's love working through us. And so I want to remind you all on this day that God's action brings hope. We only have to open up our eyes to see it. And so maybe think about today and in your past where you have experienced hope and how that it might just be God acting your life and how you might act in others' lives to give them hope. God's action brings hope. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and our brothers as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. Our prayers of the people today comes from Robin Wardlaw. Let us pray. Creator God, liberating spirit, risen Christ, we join our hearts with your people everywhere as we remember all who are oppressed and the prophets who advocate for them. We join our voices with all the saints who have journeyed the way of love before us and all those who take up the work of peace and justice in our time. We pray for victims of violence and those who create violence. We pray for victims of uncaring systems and those who benefit from those systems. We pray for this fragile planet and those who wound it. Let this week be holy. Let this time be filled with grace and mercy. Let this place be a sanctuary for those in pain and a cradle for the birth of hope and faith and love. Let this time of worship bring us closest together and closer to you, eternal one. We gather all our prayers together into the prayer that Jesus taught us saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us now go forth 
secure in the knowledge of God's goodness and love. Awake to the encounters with the resurrected Christ as we live in God's creation by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and always. Amen. Upon your